video, I've been on the news, if you Google my name, you'll see me there. And that was not by accident, so I'll just tell you a quick story. So, I teach about communicable diseases at UWA, and when COVID started, I went and made sure I read up all the paperwork and all that stuff to produce lectures. So then someone gave me a, asked me to do a podcast, and then I did a podcast talk about COVID, and then UWA Media picked it up and said, oh, but I can talk about COVID. I got called Channel 7, ABC, all these people were calling me. And what I was doing, late at night when other people are drinking and enjoying themselves, I'm studying. So though I have my, my master's, my undergraduate degree and my PhD, mm -hmm. I'm still studying all the time. So the only reason why you see me on TV is because I do extra study. I'm not extra smart, more smarter than my other lecturers in my cohort or what, but I do extra study. You know what I'm saying? So one thing we need to push ourselves, and as Dr. said earlier on, he has so many degrees. How many degrees and the must have? <laughs> <laughs> and, and a whole line of them. Because you just have to keep studying. And this is one thing about formal education. It never stops. It never stops. This information is always changing. And even me, the reason why I had to keep studying was because one minute you have one variant, then they're like Omnicron, and then they're always like, what? I, mean, I, had, I was constantly scanning information. I mean, people did abuse me on Facebook, but that was another matter. Someone said I should be deported back to Africa. Anyhow. Sorry for that. Anyhow, so the basic thing is, formal education never stops. So anyone in the room, if you think it has stopped, I mean, sorry, Dr. Dominic, I did not um, um, acknowledge you. Constantly study. You know what I'm saying? Because it never stops. So even those who are highly qualified, you have to keep getting more qualification. Go for management courses. I go for you know, other things, as you said, COVID helped us do start stuff on, online. So if you really want to get up to the echelons of power, we really have to arm ourselves with knowledge. Nobody wants a quack on TV talking about COVID. You know what I'm saying? Because they will shoot it as a barber and say, what? Mm. So I have to make sure that when I open my mouth, I know what I'm talking about. If I don't know something, someone called me that they said, Barbara, can you comment on this? I said, I'm not coming. Because I don't want them to say, black woman said, what? <laughs> if I don't know what I'm talking about, I won't go on TV. But if I've studied hard, I'll get up there and speak. Mm. So if you want to get up into the issue, that's what it is. You know what I'm saying? We are black. We can't bleach us, and some do, but we can't bleach out the blackness. You know what I'm saying? Ultimately, we have to arm ourselves with knowledge and education if we want to be out there. So if you want to be a CEO of something, I mean, you can't be open, of course, your own company, but if you want to get into these big gun companies, we have to arm, arm ourselves with MBAs, be smart, network, learn the accent. I don't know what you need to do, but do it. <laughs> okay, um. Oh, you want me to add something to it? Yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, in terms of how do you get up there and how do we motivate people to do it, I would tackle it from um, different angles. I would first acknowledge OEC what you are doing with the annual awards uh, to Africans who stand out in various um, endeavors. That's very encouraging. Um, it was one of those awards that got me into some places. Um, at the time, I was working for UWA with the School of Pharmacy, uh, working with a team that we were writing dictionary for the World Health Organization on breastfeeding. And I am not a scientist. But somehow, I convinced the panel that, uh, <laughs> convinced the panel that I was able to contribute to it. And I haven't studied lactation, I haven't studied anything breastfeeding, but I told them they should give me two weeks. Um, I got the job and I enjoyed myself writing up dictionary for breastfeeding. How? Personal studies. It never stops. Um, when, and I'm going to say it again, I taught age care when I haven't done age care before. Uh, I went, I was so desperate for a job, they said they needed an aged care teacher. I put up my hand for it. You <laughs> see, if you know how to communicate or present, even when you don't have it, people see your candor, your honesty. They see the transferability of the skill you've got. I said, if you give me this, I can do it. They said, okay, let's try it. I went in there, um, they said, when can you start? I said, give me one month. Um, 
I, the one man they, they thought I was sorting my accommodation, I, I was actually preparing. Mm -hmm. I took up all the textbooks and I was learning, I was studying. What is a hoist? I haven't seen one before. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being honest with you, I hadn't seen one before, but all of a sudden I started calling uh, places, um, all the places where they have all those play, uh, the, the, the equipment, I went in there, so what is that? I was pretending I wanted to buy one, <laughs> I, they, they explained things to me, I would get manuals, come back home and learn, etc. Within the first year of my teaching of aged care, um, because I, I hadn't touched an aged person before, mm -hmm. what I would do, is that we'll have a guest lecturer. I will invite a guest lecturer, an African, who will come in and teach them how to change the pap, the, the, all the, all the diapers and all that. Um, and I, 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 I didn't own up like I hadn't done it before. I just said she's coming as a guest yes. lecturer. <laughs> just, just to put everything in context, the students liked what I did and the school liked it so much so that when I told them I had one year to finish my PhD, so I told them I was just cutting off everything, I wanted to focus on the PhD, they said no, we're not letting you go. And as a result of the deal, they increased the pay and bought me a brand new Mac to keep me for another one year. And I went like, I went, I came back and said, Lisbeth, Lisbeth. <laughs> what am I saying? I'm just saying that, look, Confidence is built, it just means you know what you are doing. As an African, I'll tell you one secret. Anytime I enter into a purely non-African environment, I expect to be underestimated. That's my expectation. So I go in to prove people wrong. When you enter, people will take you for granted. Until you start knowing your audience. Because if you go there and you are like, um, um, you know what, um, you know, uh, by the grace of God, you know, uh, and we blame everything on just faith and all that, you, you, you need to be competent. As, 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 as you, you need to know your onions, you need, you need to know what you are talking about. And then be able to work. I, I, I did consultancy for an organization that she was work, working for, and they had a very interesting CEO. Um, who reasoned wonderfully and a time came she was just she, she thought that I needed a job I went up to her one and said thank you I'm walking away I'm not doing this job anymore she was shocked because she didn't expect that somebody like me will come to her and say if this is not done I'm leaving why I always say to people add value to yourself yeah, exactly. yeah, Thank you. Hi. Okay. Mara in Perth. The jazz has me doing nothing to speak, which was very hard, but I did it, and it was good. And the radio called me and said, oh, do you want to come into the interview? But the interview was a little bit political, because they wanted me to talk about mining in Africa, and I'm a mining engineer, so I didn't say much. Anyway, let me go to the business. <laughs> Thank you very much, OFC, for organizing this, and thank you for the panelists. And um, thank you for Dr. Barbara in particular, why I say this. I have a question, but I want to say something briefly before, so that my question makes sense. I was at one, I'm not going to name universities and, and organizations. It's an organization X. I was studying. Diploma of Laboratory Techniques. And back in high school, I was among the top five students. So I know I was not dumb. But I always ask questions. So I went to the lecture and asked questions. I think she was annoyed with my way of asking, maybe too much. And she said, you're not an academic. Just go and look for a job. And now I stayed up to now, and I don't think I'll ever forget that. So. As I was studying, I tried my best, I was good. But any time when I failed, that way came back. So five years later, she even forgot. Went to enroll into one, one of the universities. And thank God, and thank her, she did help me get through. Because we had to do one course, about three semesters, and when I wanted to enroll into engineering, 
They said, no, nah, you, you don't have enough mass physics. I said, can you give me a test? I was confident in myself. And they said, no, that's not the way we do it here. You need to go through a college or... So I had to do a six months course. And I think the minimum was 65%. So I got above 65%. And then the lady helped me enroll. So I enrolled, I started studying, studying. And any time I felt there's this unit, the concept was just hard to get. And I started thinking of dropping. Maybe that lady, she was right. Maybe I'm not smart. <laughs> but then I was like, but I used to get higher marks. How come? So my friend kept, kept on encouraging me. So I passed and I graduated. And I was planning to say to go and see the lecture and say, look, never say this thing to the student. You thought I couldn't graduate. And my friend said, no, don't do that. Just let go. Just keep, keep doing what you're doing. But in all these stories that I said, there's some concepts that are really hard, because English is my fifth language. Wow. When I say fifth, I mean fifth. <laughs> all the other four. <laughs> yeah, all the other four actually speak Swahili, <laughs> Lingala, <laughs> French, a little bit of Arabic in my own mother tongue. Yeah. yeah. And a little bit of Spanish on top. <laughs> so if you want to test me even now. <laughs> Um, I think some, one of the, she was a PhD candidate and one had a master, they did help me. This is, uh, I think, mechanics of solids. Some of the concepts were really hard. So they had to explain to me in Swahili, some of these concepts. And I came to realize that the concept was not that hard. I think it was just the, the language and the terms. Now, here comes my question. I think he knows the subject, he's an engineer as well. So, for the panelists and for Re uh, Mentor Reconnect, or whatever the name is, yes, yes, yes. would you consider or advise some of your colleagues or yourself to, for, like, to explain things in a language that someone understands better? I know in an English system, just to try and understand something so you can stack on one thing and think like you're not understanding because you're not, you're dumb, and yet it's not about being dumb, it's about maybe the way you're transferring, maybe it's the language. Yeah. And I, I believe Chinese in China, they learn in Chinese. Yeah. Whereas where I come from, Congo, DRC, we learn in French. And when we go home, some 95 percent we don't speak French at home. So it can be a, a tough situation. So the question is, I'm sorry for taking long. Would you consider that, or would you advise whoever is um, in the program of teaching to try and put things in the language that someone can understand? Then once they understand, then they can move on with the you know, language. So that's my question. Thank you. I think that's a brilliant question because language is something very difficult to understand and if we took an ordinary Australian and said let's go to France and learn in French, I'm sure they would not do well either because French is a, is a difficult language. Bonjour or something like that. Anyway, so I think it's a brilliant question and I don't know how universities would take it, but I think it's a really good idea, particularly, uh, I found a lot of times international students are not doing well. It's not because they don't understand, but it's because of the concept. Yeah. And personally, I actually teach in a lot of analogies. I tell a lot of analogies. I tell, oh, I'll come up, I cook, up, I cook them up at night. I'll be lying there in bed thinking to myself, okay, this concept is so difficult to explain. How can I, ex how can I explain it better? And my students generally do very well and say I'm a very good lecturer. And as I said, it's not because I'm smarter than anybody else, it's because I try to bring the, a very difficult concept into a very simple concept. And I think it's something I learned over time. I learned it from my father and other people. And so I tell a lot of stories, a lot of anal analogies. In fact, if you fail my unit, you actually dance in my class because I really take time with students. I'll tell them, meet me on MS Teams, and because now we do MS Teams, you have to meet me face to face, and I'll teach you for three hours and go over concepts again and again. So I think it's actually a very brilliant question. Of course, the problem is you have so many languages. As you said, you speak five, so I don't know whether or not the universities could do that across five languages, <laughs> but maybe starting with the bigger sort of groups of people yes. and trying to explain concepts. Yes. I think yes. it's a really good 
the thing because language is very, very difficult. And something we take for granted, we just think someone will automatically understand, but sometimes there's that. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, quick question. Um, throughout all the discussions, I realized that one gap that seems to exist, especially between parents and young people, has to be the bond of friendship. Mm. The bond of friendship. Normally, with the African perspective, it's more of authoritarian from the parents, and then you, the child, or the young person, having to be, okay, um, the student at home. Mommy speaks, you have to listen. But that bond of friendship doesn't exist. So from you, how can parents, okay, cultivate that bond of friendship where at home it's not teacher, student again? Because they go to the classrooms and it's the same thing. But when you come home, breaking that territory of teacher, student, or that authoritarianism within that space, and letting the student, the student feel, oh, mommy is not a caricature. Daddy is not somebody that, no, but somebody I can easily relate to and talk to without being judged. Thank you. Um, I'm going to confess that's exactly what my son told me. He said, um, Mom, in this house I'm not a child, I'm a student. That's exactly what he told me. And just going back to the, Madame, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. In fact, you should have been on the panel. You should have been on the panel. From the way you were talking, you should have been on the panel, not in the crowd. But, um, the, the truth is, and I think the way we were brought up was not like that. Our parents, we did what they said. In fact, I'm a doctor because of my mother. I wanted to be a pilot and all that, but she insisted. Because everybody said, oh, Barbara is better than maths and all. She said, Barbara is going to be a doctor, and she prophesied and eventually became one. <laughs> so, that is the way we were brought up. And so for us to sort of change that attitude and realize, I mean, our children may not be our friends, but showing them love and acceptance. I think that is more like it, because sometimes a parent may not be naturally your friend, I mean, the way your friends are. And, and, but I think to have love and acceptance is where we need to, to, to start. And it's a learning journey that all of us are on. And in fact, sometimes I've had to put up a mirror on my own self and say, Barbara, you're not doing things in, that, that, that support your own son. And so, I think it's a journey for us as well. It's something that we need to sort of get around our heads as well because that's not the way we were brought up. Mm -hmm. My father was not my friend. <laughs> my mother was certainly not my friend. And sometimes, and, and those, it had a positive element to it because our parents were busy also. Yeah. We were scattered around the place. There were seven of us. Our father just had to be strict to get us through. And when you look back, there were positive to it. Because when my father died, um, he died in 2008, I was here. I had a lecture to give in the evening and I went and gave it. And I thought, my father drove our education, my mother drove our education, we are who we are because of them. And so there are that, those positive elements that we had from, because otherwise maybe I would have got pregnant at 13 or something like my cousins. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we were brought up in that strict environment and it, had, it did have those positives. Mm -hmm. So that is what unfortunately sometimes we carry on. Mm -hmm. And one time, and this will be my last story, I tell too many stories. Um, it was the end of the um, semester for the children, and my son said, oh, other children aren't coming. It was three days to the end of the term. Oh, other children aren't coming to school. And I said, why not? Why not? They're paying fees. Why aren't they coming in the last three days? And he said, they don't have African mothers. <laughs> <laughs> Because of time, fact, uh, we have uh, four people are coming, please. We have this young man for a long time. Just the last one, please. Okay. Let's, just the last one. one. That gentleman, can I add something? Yeah. To also close the gap between a parent and a child. Parents, we need to educate ourselves. Yeah. Where are we now? We need to change. And part of changing, Thanks, Dr. David, for being here. Let's keep our fingers crossed. If OSC managed to get some money, there's the training that we run. It's really good as a mom to take also time off to go and attend those training. Educate yourself. We are in Australia. We are not in Africa. The way we were brought up is different. Your kids, as well, growing up with aunties, uncles, and everyone, here, whom do they have around them? It's only friends. So we have to be available and change our stars.
that would be the last. Uh, just mine's real quick, it's really uh, direct. Uh, what are your thoughts on smacking kids to teach them to do better in Australia? <laughs> <laughs> do you think that hitting your kid creates bad behaviors in them, especially within the team? Education. <laughs> 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 Yes, I grew up being smart, but really if you do it here, you'll be surprised. I remember my little boy when I was back in New Zealand, he used to push buttons. Smack me, smack me then. But he had left it from school. He was eight by then. I'll call him triple zero. Smack me. Smack. He will push and push. And if I happen to do it, we had another parent who was pushed to that limit and they end up doing it. Unfortunately, I was part of the psychologist who was working with that parent. It, it, it's embarrassing. So here, to answer it in a short form, we don't smack, we talk. And when we talk, it's what we call on negotiations. But you take a parent's position. Or a mental position. Then chop some sense into your kids. And if they can't hear you, consult with other people. That's why we, mental me is there. It takes a village to raise a child. You are not on your own. Let them talk to another parent and get that from them. Thank you. I think the problem is, I don't want to call it a problem. I mean, as you said, many of us were beaten at both at school and home. So if you didn't get 100%, if you got 50, you got 15 canes for not getting 100. So I mean, beating was a normal thing. Yeah. And also, gender is domestic violence. Men beat women, women beat children and all that. And men beat each other. But I think it comes down to the inability to use our words. And I think that's the thing. We, we have never learned how to use our words yes. yeah. and to speak. Mm -hmm. So it's just easier to hit. Yeah. And when you hit, what you're looking for is manipulation and coercion. Yeah. instead of negotiation. And that is something that we have never learned many, as many Africans and also African parents. So if we learn to use our words and negotiate, because sometimes the child may actually be saying something sensible, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and have that discussion, okay, and then eventually if it's okay, yes, I've said you have to go to school, you've had a discussion around you. So I think it's about learning how, and we, many times many of us, even me, I don't know how to use my words. If something upsets me, I go quiet. Yeah. And sometimes it annoys people because they're like, why don't you speak up? Yeah. But it's just because I was never taught how to use my words. And when I tried to use my words, I was spanked. Yeah. So smacking is, uh, is uh, as I said, uh, inefficient. We don't know how to use our words, and it is actual violence. It is violating someone else's body. Because you're trying to hit them, and you're trying to hit them to prevent them. And parents may think it's all right, but it's not all right. The children have rights, so we must think how best to, to get them on side. Because it's all about talking. You know, and teenagers, because you said teenagers are particular boys, they are going through emotions, they are going through hormonal changes, and sometimes what you see as rebellion is, some, is something which is completely out of their control. Now, in the past in Africa, boys at that age would go out and hang out with men. You know what I'm saying? And go out and do sort of manly things and sort of go through that rite of passage. Now they don't have that, and then we think that they are, they are mad, they are crazy, they are forming gangs. Guns, people. Now look at police. Let's look, let's look at police and look, let's look at the bikies. Those are all guns. They're groups of men who come together for a purpose. So when people say Africa should not be in guns, young men are trying to look for their identity. Mm -hmm. So right now my son, as I said earlier on, is with black platinum. Now they're not doing anything wrong. They're just flashing around with their cars and roaming and having loud, loud, loud exhausts because they, he wants to hang out with other men. And somebody said, Mom, you don't understand you're with a man. Yes, I'm actually with a man. And he's right. So when he hangs out with young African men, all he's trying to do is to strengthen his identity as a young man. He plays African music in his car, and that's the thing, because he doesn't want to lose his identity and where he originally comes from. So back to the, the, the beating or smacking, I think it's because we need to learn how to use our words, even with our own children. We need to learn how to speak. Thank you. I think that we, we have uh, come to the end of uh, uh, this program, uh, uh, the panel part of the discussion. And um, unless 
unless for 10 seconds if anybody else among the panelists wants to summarize just for 10 seconds if not I will I just want to thank you all for listening you could have been somewhere else on this early morning you could have been enjoying yourselves so thank you for listening to our stories thank you for being here all I do for each and every one in this room, I just want to wish you the best, whether you're a parent, a child, whatever it is you're striving to do, just work hard at what you do and you will get there. And as you said earlier on, a crisis is an opportunity. We all have crises. Even me, you, stand, you see me here, I have crises every day. But it has made me stronger, it has made me more appreciative, it has also helped me grow. And we are all still growing. So thank you very much for coming, and thank you for listening to us. Thank you, thank you very much, the moderators and the, the panel. I am not the one doing the vote of that. But I want to say that uh, for us to get uh, the, some final question or final word, uh, my president is here. And I want to ask our executive, or is he executive, as Joe finds his way here, uh, to talk. Can we have all the executive, or is he executive, we are here to stand with? Joe Kuwasama, who is the president, I'm the vice, uh, dealing with finance and administration. We have uh, the man, the money man, the treasurer, uh, <laughs> yeah, Singara. I, I have never known how to pronounce him properly because I am from East Africa, he is from... Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we, have the, we have the person who is behind the research department, Dr. Dominic. Dr. Dominic is a, a lecturer at the UWA, and we have our youth director, um, uh, Lassine, and Lassine has also become our full-time administrator in OAC, so we are very happy to have <laughs> So when you talk, when you come during the day, at least there's someone here who can listen to you. Lassine has got a wife. <laughs> so when you come, please don't, don't look at it. Can you sign up? I, I, like, I like people knowing because when you come, don't come to other things. Please. <laughs> yeah, that's, I said I'm a vice president dealing with finance and administration. He is the vice president dealing with operations. Um, Laura, can you just say hi to people? Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't seeing you, sorry. Yeah, I didn't mean to speak. Well, thanks again for sacrificing your um, afternoon to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, as uh, the president uh, talks, I want all the mental media connects release to stand up. Who are here? <laughs> you, my dad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Because I want a few people to see our current students, the ones who are dealing with the mental media connect. There are few who could not make it today. And uh, yeah, no, yeah, thank you very much. After this, we are going to ask one of you randomly to to pass a vote of dance. So each of you should be prepared. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pick randomly. Uh, you can have your seat. Don't forget Tony. Thank you. Anthony. Uh, so, uh, we've got our volunteers here. Yeah. Tony Barton, who chair the voluntary committee. Sarah, who has been our uh, chair. And uh, also, Madam Director, the women director is here. I want to say thank you to all of you for coming. Uh, thank you to all our guests, our panel. Thank you very much. Uh, David, you know, Kwajo said something that um, people who think like us, to be involved in the process, and you're one of those that think for us, and I want to say thank you. Um, we don't stand here, but I said you can step on the toes. Step on it. 
<laughs> uh, it's been a very uh, fruitful morning, and I want to recommend that we have these discussions on a very regular basis. Uh, but I just want to be brief. We know that there are issues here. There are systemic issues that we are faced with. Uh, one of the panel talk about advocates. I have done this for the last 14 years, that in fact people have seen me toxic. Some ministers and government officials don't like me. Some directors and departments don't like me, but I don't care because I know what I stand for, because I have looked through the glass and I've seen those issues. There are discussions that we initiated 12 years ago that money was invested into to make sure that by this time we should be talking something different. But we are still talking the same thing today. And I think they take our time for granted. They take it to be, uh, these people don't have time. You have something to do with time. That's why you are here this morning. You could have been home or doing something. So when the government department or somebody tells us, come, let's do this, it means you should be up for business. If you would just solicit our view and go and just recycle into the bin, there's no need. But I'm, I'm, I really think that we as people from Africa can handle our own issues. We can take our issues in our hands, not through the inappropriate way, through the proper way. There is no society that can succeed without being educated. Yeah. And there is no educated society that does not have uh, prosperity, that does not have liberty, that does not have value and ethics. And this is something that we are struggling with. Nobody needs to tell us when they walk in here today, they know that we are all African. No matter which country you come from, we are all Africans. But if we look at the Asian community, and you look at the Jewish and other people, sometimes we talk about numbers. They are not a huge number when they succeed. It is because they are together. It's because they are together. I read something recent time about the apartheid in South Africa. At the time they were putting all the South Africans, the, Afri the, the black South Africans, under that oppression, the, the, the white population was just 20%. Mm. So how can 20% put an 80% population under such an oppression for a long time? The very first time I ever sat and listened to Kwajo speak, that was many years ago. He said when, Colum uh, when slavery was being canceled, our chief already had African slaves in that uh, dungeon yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and telling them, please, before you cancel this, let me send this one across. <laughs> and when I look at myself, I'm a, I'm a man. I'm not a small boy. When I go to the gym, I'm lifting weight, and some of the, the young boys are looking at me and saying, what are you feeling on? So if three or four men come from Europe in a ship and grab hundreds of us mm. and take us to Africa, I mean to Europe, mm. as slaves, it means there's something not working. Yeah. That a four, four men can come and take uh, up to hundreds of us to Europe and enslave us. And when they are carrying us, the painful thing is they are relaxing in, their, in, in the comfort of their boat and drinking and making party and enjoying the African women they carry along. But we are in team and people are protecting them and we are protecting them at the same time. We are here. It is time that we think of the next generation of Africans. A lot of people think that Joe uh, is doing this community because he wants to get money. No. If I was getting money from the community, I wouldn't go to work. This woman, if she was not a mother, her husband was accused of having a relationship. Because we've talked so many times that my children think she's my grandmother. I mean, they're, they're, they're yeah, grandmother. So they say, your mom. Mm. When it's all, that's my mom. So we all here got responsibility. But the reason we come to do the community is not because of money. There's no money here. Because if there were money here, then poor the Pajou would not be here. They got charged. But we are doing this to see the next generation. The panel touched a lot of great things here. If we don't put our next generation to that place, to manage what we are planting today, 
we can build all the best houses here. They will be in prison. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Exactly. If any of you people go to America, mm -hmm. go and see the prisons in yeah. America. Yeah. There's more black yeah. Africans in prison. So what can we do as people? We will have our challenges and our individual differences. What can we do to come together and support people like us who are brave and have no fear how the minister feels about us when we talk to them because that's what we were called for. There was one meeting we had recently with somebody from the Department of State. Why? We prepared a comprehensive business plan and we told them there are issues in the educational system and we are mentoring children across the school. Madam Bassey is an elder. And he takes his time and goes to the school. My Felicia here, Tony, all the people who go to the school here, they leave their daily work. They come and we prepare a business plan and tell them, when you support us to make our children good, we are making you and your children to be comfortable and safe. They didn't listen to it. Last week, I got a call from Arima Koma. That's a student who has issues. She doesn't want to talk to the parents. She doesn't want to talk to the school. They want to talk to Auntie Salam. Because Auntie Salam now works full time. She cannot go. Every week. Before, before that, there's a call from Italy. A parent there feels like the students have been discriminated. And the school is playing low profile. So one of the teachers said, there's a guy who, when he comes, they will shame him. Talk to him. And he called me. And I thought, I'm just giving up. I said, but I'm director, you work with this person. It is constant. Then we're talking about prison, we're talking about this. But what are we doing as a community? Why are we aligning our division? Why are we staying, not coming together? You see this building we sit in here? This building was leased for 10 years. It's supposed to be for the African community. If we want for our non-Africans to respect us, when they walk through it, it should be class. You don't come to this kind of makeshift thing, then you say, these people are community, I should respect them. They will never respect us. But when we tell you, well, let's make this building to be something extra, that when the city of Sterling, who gives us this building, see this place, they will value us. Everybody will put their money in their pocket. But we can go to clubs and spend over $100. We are not investing in our children. Our children are getting very, very well presented in prison. And those of you men and women who feel that call that join us to do the Mentoring Reconnect, I want to say thank you. Because it takes a village to raise a child. But we also need to help these children to make it happen. Everybody needs a champion. Thank you very much. We hope we can have this uh, forum on a regular basis. Uh, David, Kwajo, Wilson, I need some money for you guys. That studio room out there, please go and see it. We want to invest in our studio so that you can come here at your leisure and do podcasts. We can put on TikTok, we can put on LinkedIn. So those that are able to come here can hear some of these things. They can know where we need the help. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, our church has built a world-class studio and more friends for us. Yes. Thank you very much. So thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Uh, I said that uh, we're going to get uh, um, a random person. As Rosemary, can you put a photo of that in one minute? Because we are exactly at one. We finish on time. So wherever you are, can you stand up and uh, pass a photo of that on behalf of your colleagues? Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Rosemary. <laughs> yeah. um, we are very, very happy uh, because of our speakers who are speaking to us this, uh, in this meeting. Uh, Dr. Barbara, uh, Salome, and Dr. Kwajo, who was my lecturer okay. three years ago at uni. <laughs> very good lecturer. So it's a pleasure that you have spoken to us and you have answered questions. So thank you very much. And also on behalf of o, um, OAC, um, please receive our gratitude for organizing this event. 
I'm sure there's a lot that happened behind the scenes before this event would be the way it's come out to be. All the preparation, all the invitations, the guests who have joined us today on behalf of the organization and the cohorts that are attending the program for Mentally Reconnect. Thank you very much. And thank you, thank you, thank you. We have learned so much and we hope to connect later so that we can keep learning and we can keep asking questions. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. We need to get, uh, let's see, can you tell me, we need to get a, a photo for all of us. Yes. Uh, how, do you want, how do you want it to be? To yeah, how do you want it to be? Here, or facing this way? Or do you want the speakers to yeah. come back and then you take a picture like this? Is that okay? Photo, yes, which way you want? Yeah, we, we want everybody yeah. or just the panel? Huh? We want with everybody? Yeah, yeah, we want to get everyone in. Oh, yeah. we stand that side? We stand that side? Yeah. Can we then stand that side? Yeah. Alright. Yeah. This side, this side, guys.
You want to come and see? Ready, guys? Yeah. Two. Okay. <laughs> well, you can go like uh, hands up, something like that. But your camera is still. <laughs> <laughs> quick, quick question. This bottle's in the in the photo. Right? <laughs> Just. <laughs>
opportunity. And I really love to speak to young people. I'm passionate about you because you are found in two different kind of worlds. You are neither here nor there. And we need to come around you. This is what I kind of devote myself to do now with my children being grown up. To stand by your side. To tell you that the crisis you see is an opportunity. There is a fact about everything. And there is a truth about everything. The fact is that it's a crisis at the moment. But the truth is that it's an opportunity. It's a stepping stone to something else. So, color or no color, determine within yourself. You are not what you are called. There's something from the inside that you can pull out and stand with your head toward. Thank you, uh, Dr. Barbara. She was talking about lifelong learning in summary. But I'll put it this way. Whatever thing you do, sharpen your skills. When you sharpen your skills, the world will come seeking you out. And we know how to make dresses. I don't need a signboard. I don't need the marketing. My work will speak for me. Do you understand? So if you are a brick layer, dear brother, dear sister, do it exceptionally, such that nobody can wave you aside. They need a good care. I'm a nurse, and I've stood out as a nurse. I have been willed money on my job. I didn't even know it. The lawyers called me. And I didn't do it because I saw this person is having money. He didn't look like anybody who had anything. And he did the will without me knowing. Are you getting what I'm trying to say? How did I work? I work as own to God. Whoever you are, the denominator is you are a human being. That's right. And I'll give you that service. White, black, tall, short, gay, straight, crooked, whatever thing you are. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> that is the truth. Give your best and walk away. Don't look for it. Somebody has called me. She came in person to me. We have a family business. And she asked me to come work for her own business. And I said, I'm sorry. This is a family business I can do. Dear youth.